Now, in, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 here, we're going to be focusing more on the first part of the chapter than on the latter part. We see here at the beginning part, he gives off, there's basically an admonition here to take heed. And the text verse that I'm going to be preaching on is, is, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. That's in verse number 12, and we're going to be getting to that in just a second. This is, that's that's the, the title of my sermon, is Take Heed Lest Ye Fall. And this is something that I don't care how long you've been saved for. This applies to everybody. This is a truth. Maybe you've heard this before. It's not uncommon. This is not an uncommon sermon here to preach. But it's something that we need to be reminded of over and over again, especially in the last times, and we're going to get into that. And we're being admonished in this chapter to take heed. Verse number 6 tells us, now what he does is he's going on this list. He's going to give us all these sins of the things that the children of Israel did after they were um, led free from the bondage of Egypt. Right? This, is, this goes back and talks about the children of Israel and what they did when Moses had them in the wilderness. And look at verse number 6 of 1 Corinthians 10. It says, Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. So all the things we're going to be going over right now, he says, hey, that happened. They're examples for us today. Don't just read the Old Testament and just think, like, oh yeah, well that's just something that happened back then. It's applicable. If it's in God's word, it's applicable for us today. Even the law, even the things that, that we don't practice today, they're all, you know, the, God's word is given by inspiration of God, and, and all of it is profitable for doctrine, for, for instruction, and um, it, it's, it's profitable for us today, even if we don't follow it, if we don't, you know, necessarily adhere to some of the Old Testament commands. It's all profitable for us. And what he's saying here is we need to learn from the mistakes that the children of Israel made back in that time. And let's look at some of the things he did. Verse number 7, I'm not going to read the entire verse if we just read this chapter. Verse number 7, he said, neither be ye idolaters. So verse 6 was, they lusted, right? They had lust. They coveted. Verse number 7, they were idolaters. Verse number 8, neither let us commit fornication. Neither let us tempt Christ. Verse 10, neither murmur ye. Murmuring is like complaining, right? They weren't satisfied. They weren't happy with what they had, so they were complaining. And then verse number 11 reiterates, after it goes through that whole list of each of those verses, <coughs> 7, 8, 9, and 10, 11 says, now these things all happen unto them for in samples. And then following up with verse 12, Wherefore, so because of these things, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. These are all common things that a Christian, that a person can fall into when they think that they're standing, when they think that they're doing just fine. Idolatry, lust, fornication, tempting Christ, complaining, murmuring against God. All of these things, we need to take heed. We need to take heed because, you know, just because you're saved and you're free from the eternal punishment of your sin, it doesn't mean that you can't stumble and fall. And that's exactly what happened. I mean, the children of Israel, this, is, this was God's chosen people, right? God did a huge miracle. I mean, the, the events that happened in Egypt with Moses and all the miracles and the plagues on Egypt and everything, that's referred to throughout the entire Bible. This is a major event in history, and that, that takes up a significant portion of Scripture, is that event taking place in Exodus and all the reference going back to that, when God, with a mighty hand and a stretched out arm, brought his people out of Egypt. I mean, these, the things that happen in that book, they don't happen every day. These happen very very few times in history where God has done the, the, the miraculous events to the scale that happened in Egypt. And that's why he's always pointing back to it, being like, look at everything that I did to bring these people out and all the plagues and everything that happened in, in, in Egypt because it's such a significant event. Now, God had his chosen people, right? His people that he decided where his name was going to be preached they were in bondage in Egypt. They were under servitude. They were in slavery. They had to do all this hard work. They weren't getting paid. And they kept getting oppressed more and more and more to the point to where they were telling them they had to kill their children if a male son was born because they didn't like the fact that they were growing and multiplying and they were outnumbering the Egyptians. The Egyptians said, no, you have to kill your children. This is the level of slavery. This is the level of oppression that they were under. I mean, having being forced to, to kill your own child. To send them down the stream is what happened with Moses. That was, I mean, they hit him because they, they were, his parents were righteous. They didn't want to kill him. 
and you know, they sent his sister to go follow and make sure that he was going to be all right. But that's the tyranny that they were living under at that time. And this was God's people. God heard their prayer. God decided to deliver them. All the great miracles, and, this is, and every single time I preach this, every single time I read this, it blows me away that those people saw the power of God. Those people walked across the Red Sea as if on dry ground <coughs> with the water as a wall on either side of them. No doubt that God's hand was in that and God was leading them and protecting them. No doubt. But then, after a very short period of time, God destroyed, you know, God had destroyed their enemies. He leads them out miraculously. There's no question, no doubt about it, no other explanation besides God protecting them and doing those things for them. Yet they still do all of these things. They become idolaters, they commit fornication, they tempt Christ, they murmur, they complain. Oh, you brought us out in the wilderness to kill us with hunger. Oh, you brought us out in the wilderness to die of thirst. And, you know, they, Moses is gone in the mountain for 40 days, and they're just like, oh, well, we don't know what happened to Moses. Make us a god. Make, you know, they, build a, they have Aaron create an idol for him. All of these things they do. And this is what I put it. It happened to them. It happened to the children of Israel that came out of Egypt. They saw all these great things, yet they still fell into all of these different temptations, all of these different sins. We need to take heed today. We need to take heed because... If they who witnessed all of those things were still able to, to fall into all those different temptations, all those different sins that they did, it's possible for us today too. Okay, and we need to take heed. And that's why he, go, he goes through this whole list. He said, look, you shouldn't be an idolater. You shouldn't be a murmurer. You shouldn't tempt Christ. Take heed lest you fall. Take heed. Now, we're going to be tempted. But it's important that we understand um, where our temptations even come from. If you would, turn to James chapter 1. James chapter 1 explains a little bit about our temptations. See, sir, we need to take heed lest we fall. And why we need to take heed is because we're going to be tempted. Okay, there's going to be temptations coming our way. And temptations, another word for temptation is just a testing. That's all it is, a temptation. It's a testing, it's a trial. And you'll see in James chapter 1, look at verse number 12 of James chapter 1. It says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, see, notice that a man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried. A temptation is a trial, something that's trying you. He shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Verse number 13 let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. So, first of all, understand that when you're tempted, when you're tried like that, it's not coming from God. God is not the one who's putting you, who, who's putting this, this sinful desire or this, you know, the, the opportunity to sin in front of your face. You're not tempted of God. God doesn't tempt any man, it says right here, with evil. But look at verse 14, it says, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. It's your own heart that's tempting you. It's your own heart of, of why you even have this struggle with sin. It's not coming from God. The temptation isn't coming from God where God's going to, gonna, you know, put a, a scantily clad woman in front of your face to see if you're going to lust after her. God's not doing that. It's your own lust. It's your own heart that's drawing you away that is tempting you. It says in verse 15, it says, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. The, the tempting comes from your own heart, and that's where the sin comes from. That's where the lust comes from. However, we could have, uh, flip back if you would to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Back where we were, I should have told you to keep a finger there. Even though we're going to be tempted, even though we're going to go through this stuff, and it's and we have a sinful heart, it's important to understand that God's not going to allow us to go through too much temptation. See, it's also important to note here too that there's temptation. The another name for the devil is the tempter. G, uh, the devil, is, Satan, is referred to as the tempter twice in the Bible, and. Um, 
He's going to be tempting you. He's going to be pulling on, on the strings of your heart, of the, the sin strings of your heart. He's going to be the one that's going to try to get you to stumble and to fall into sin. It's not God. God's not the one. God doesn't want you to get into sin. God doesn't want you to, 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 to screw up and backslide and get into these things. But the devil does. The devil's trying to keep you away from God. But here's the thing, is that God won't allow him to do too much to where you won't be able to bear it. See, God only allows the temptations to happen to where you're still capable of overcoming that. If we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, look at verse number 13. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to to bear it. Now, he's saying, first of all, no temptation is taking you but such as a common man. We all go through the same trials. Everybody has these temptations. It's common, okay? We have a sinful nature. It's common. There's, there's certain things, especially like the sins he listed, fornication, that's a common temptation. Idolatry, that's a common temptation. Murmuring, complaining against God, that's a common temptation. These are common to man. But God is faithful. He says he will not suffer you, which means allow you to. He's not going to suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. We all have a breaking point. God knows that we're, that we're human and that we can only bear or take so much weight and so much burden. And he's saying that with the temptation, whatever temptations that we need to go to, that we're going to go through, the temptations that are common to man, he says he's also going to make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Now, not everybody does escape. Not everyone chooses to, but he's going to give you that out. He's going to make a way so that it's not too much for you to handle. Now, that doesn't mean you're never going to be tempted. But what he's doing here, especially what he's doing, is saying that, look, the responsibility is still on you to choose to do what's right. Any temptation that you're going through, just remember this, anything that you're going through, any struggle, any temptation you're going through, it's not too much. You might think in your mind that it's too much. You might get to the point where you think, I can't take this anymore. I can't handle this. God will not allow you to go through too much. He, will, he might bring you right up to that point. He might let you get right to that point, but you're not going to go over that. Anything you're going through, and we can take comfort in that. Anything that you're going through, any temptation you have, it's never going to be too much. There is a way to escape from that. Now, you have to have your eyes open to it. Your heart ought to be in a place to where you want to escape from the sin. Don't, don't let your heart get to the point where you want to get into that sin and, and fall into that temptation and just, and just embrace it and engulf it. God will have that way for you to escape, but the choice is going to be yours. The choice is up to you on what you're going to do and how you're going to handle that temptation. Will you stay true to God? Will you, you know, just keep his word in your heart and in your mind and avoid it and, and, and resist it? Resist the devil and he shall flee from you, the Bible says. But you have to resist him. That's a good, a good um, comfort we could take just knowing that whatever we go through, it's not good. God will make sure that it's not too much for you. It might be a lot, but it's not going to be too much. The devil is going to be tempting you, especially, here's the thing, the more you live a righteous and godly life, the more you decide to do what's right and you get in your heart, you know what, I really want to get on fire for God, I want to win souls to Christ, I want to do what's right, I want to clean up my life, the devil's going to come after you and he's going to tempt you. And he's going to try to get you to stumble and fall. Because when you're living in sin and, and when you're just doing whatever, God's not going to use you. God's not going to use you to do great things for him because your heart's not right with him. You're living in sin. He's going to want to use you to do great things for him, for the people who want to do what's right, the people who are, who are trying to go in that direction and trying to serve him and cleaning up their life. See, here's the thing. None of us are ever going to be perfect. And God knows this. But there's a difference between the direction that you're headed. Right? So God will use... A person who has cleaned up their life a lot and, and they're doing great things. They've gotten rid of all these different sins in their life and they're living a pretty righteous life. Well, you know who else God's going to use? He's also going to use a person who just got saved, you know, yesterday 
but their heart is right and they're and they're and they're on their journey of moving along. See, the Christian life is just like a human physical life. You start off as a baby when you get saved. That's why the Bible talks about babes in Christ. People who, who desire the sincere milk of the word. They're not able to handle meat yet. Just like my daughter Sarah can't eat anything. She doesn't have any teeth yet. She's just a young child. When you first get saved, you're a young child. But here's the thing. If you're headed the right way, spiritually now, talking about the Christian life, God's going to see that. He's going to recognize that. And he's going to look at your heart and say, okay, they might have a lot of sin in their life. Especially if you just got saved yesterday. You can have a lot of sin in your life, but God's not going to say, well, I'm not going to use that person. If your heart's right, if you say, you know what, I want, my goal is to be like Christ. Let's just say Christ is, is, is on this side of the room and, you know, living like hell and the devil is on this side of the room. If you're headed, whether you're, whether you're over here or over here or over here, if you're facing this way and you're headed this way, God's going to want to use you. And he'll help you to purge out the sin out of your life. He'll help you to get things on track. But here's the thing. If you're all the way over here, and you're headed this way, God's not going to want to use you. If you're, if you're embracing sin, if you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're just deciding, you know what, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna, I want to go this direction, even though you might have a lot less sins at this point than someone who's way over there, God's not going to want to use you. And there's going to be, you know, your life's going to be a lot different. See, God will bless the person that's way over here, but they're, they're, you know, they're moving in the right direction and trying to go that way. And that's the way that we need to make sure that we're headed. Make sure our hearts are humble. And we need to take heed. Even though you're over here, here's the thing. The person over here needs to take heed lest they fall. And make sure that you're still going the right direction. Because at any point, whether you're back there or over here, you can make, you can make that decision to turn around. And all it takes is, is, is it could, in many cases, it could be one big screw up. To where all of a sudden you were over here and now you're, and now you're going this way. And we want to make sure that that doesn't happen. Okay, just because you're way over there doesn't mean that it can't happen. And this is what he's talking about. This is, this is the admonition is to take heed. Take heed to yourself. And now I'm going to help you hopefully try to, try to figure out a way where we can make sure that we are taking heed. The first thing we need to remember is we need to stay humble. Humble. Humility. Humility. The, the, the more godly you get in your life, the more you get the sin out of your life, oftentimes, the more knowledge that you receive from the Bible especially. The Bible says, knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. The more you know, there's a tendency for people to get puffed up, to get a proud, haughty attitude. And here's the thing, God hates pride, and that will lead you to fall. The Bible says... <laughs> The Bible says, I'm going, to, I'm going to turn to this real quick right now. You don't have to turn there. But in, um, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, when he's given the, the admonition, the, um, the requirements for a pastor, when it says, not a novice, because there's a lot of, there's a lot of rules, a lot of attributes for for, here it is in verse 6. Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. That's 1 Timothy uh, 3, 6. It gives all these rules, you know, the pastor is supposed to be not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, you know, all these requirements for the pastor, but then one of the requirements is not a novice. A novice is just a beginner, someone who's, who's brand new to the faith, a, a beginner, you know, no experience doing anything. It says, lest being lifted up with pride, you fall into the condemnation of the devil. So someone who's a novice has a tendency to be lifted up with pride if they're put into the position of the pastor. <clears throat> but what's going to happen is, is he's saying, lest they fall. So the person who's lifted up with pride is going to be one that's going to be very likely then to fall. And, then, and here's the thing, God, if they're not going to fall on their own, God will bring you down. God will, will abase those that are lifted up. God will bring you down. So we need to make sure that we stay humble. See, God wants us to rely on him for everything. Not just for salvation. Of course, for salvation, we need to completely, I mean, that's the first step, is just completely trusting on God to save you. You're not trusting in yourself. You're not trusting in your works. You're not trusting how good you are. You're just completely relying on God. Hey, I don't. I, there's nothing I can do to get myself saved. I'm just going to rely on God to save me. He already did all the work. I'm relying on Him. Well, God wants us to rely on Him for everything. 
And if you're relying on God for everything in your life, if you're relying on God to just make sure that you're fed, make sure that you're clothed, make sure that every, you know, that, that whatever it is you have to deal with, you're just relying on God to help you out with that stuff, that'll keep your, your, your attitude humble. That'll keep you meek because you're not thinking that, hey, everything I'm doing, hey, this great house, hey, all this stuff that I have, uh, it's all because of me. It's all because I'm such a great person and I'm so smart and I have so much ability. Who gave you that ability? You better make sure that we're recognizing God because that, that's how that prideful attitude will start. It'll start slowly. And here's a, th here's, here's a perfect example. Okay, and I'll use myself as an example. As the pastor of this church, okay, I have to rely on God's strength. I have to rely on God's power to preach his service, to go out and get people saved. I have to rely completely on God because I'll tell you what, if I'm in my flesh, if I'm just out there trying to talk to someone with Christ, I can't do anything. It's not my own power that's going to get people saved. It's God's power. I have to rely on him that he's going to use me. And it's the same thing with getting up here and preaching. If I just get up and just preach my opinion and just, and just, just, I don't know, say whatever thoughts come to my mind, that's going to be powerless. I need God's power to help me and, and teach me to help expound the Bible unto you. But I have to be relying on God for that. If I'm just tapping into my own resources and my own ability and my own skills, I'll tell you what, my skills stink as a public speaker. <laughs> I've never been good. I've, I've always dreaded and hated public speaking. I've never been good at it. Always had a problem trying to communicate what it is that I want to say. But if I'm relying on God's power, I know that I can do it, but I have to be relying on Him. And here's the thing, in the role of a pastor, right now it's pretty easy for me to be, to be humble and, and, and to be relying on God because we have a small church. There's not very many people. There's not very much to be all lifted up with pride about. But here's the thing, Lord willing, this church is going to be running in the hundreds someday. Okay? Maybe a decade down the road. I don't know. However long it takes for this church to grow, one day this is going to be a good church. And here's where I would, where in this example, as a pastor, I can, I better not, if, and if I do, someone play this recorded sermon back to me <laughs> if it ever happened. Because it would, be a, it would be a very unwise, a very foolish thing for me to do to look back and be like, look at this great church that I built in. God's the one that builds the church. It's God's power. If I start thinking that, oh, I'm doing, doing, doing this and I'm doing that, and start getting this proud attitude because, oh, we have all these people coming in and the finances are great and the money's rolling in and we have all this stuff going on. Hey, praise God if that happens, but praise God if that happens. Not man, not me, not the pastor, not this, oh, you did, so, you know, no, God did it. God used me, but God's the one that's doing it. If that, if Lord willing, if that even happens with our church. But that's just one example where, you know, we could be lifted up with pride. Now, apply that to yourself. I mean, that could be anything. I applied that to me because that's something that I have to take heed about. I have to watch out for. But we all have to watch out for that in our life. Take heed lest you fall because you know what? God hates a proud heart and God will bring you down. The Bible says, I love this proverb because here's the thing. Most likely, this is, this is going to happen to you the, the proud attitude when things are going really well. And taking heed lest you fall, you need to take heed when everything's going great. If you've already fallen, I mean, you don't need to take heed anymore. You've already fallen. Or if you're, if, if, even if you haven't fallen, if you're still kind of low, if, you're, you know, if, if, if there's no reason for you to be lifted up with pride, hey, you probably don't have to take as much heed. But when things start going good, you know, things start rolling, you seem to be on a roll, everything's moving up in your life, take heed. I'm not saying that you're going to fall. Just, just make sure that you don't. don't. Don't get too carried away in how great everything's going. Because here's the thing. You might not be facing any temptations. Things might be going well because, you know, the devil hasn't really taken that much attention to you yet. But you start going out. You start witnessing to people and giving the gospel. You start actually making an impact. You're getting sent out of your life. You're doing all this stuff. All of a sudden... You're going to start making waves and, and people and, and the devil and his, and his demons are going to be looking and saying like, hey, what's this guy doing over here? We got to make sure we stop that and they'll, they'll start tempting you. And here's the thing. You need to be ready for that temptation when it comes. You could be going along. Things are going great. And if you're not taking heed, when that, te when that temptation comes, when those trials come, when, when the devil tries to get you to sin, if you're not taking heed, you might very well fall. Guard yourself. Be on guard. And one of the first ways that I mentioned to do that is to stay humble. 
There's a lot of wisdom in this proverb. Um, proverb you don't have to turn to Proverbs 30, verse 8 and 9, say, Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. So he's saying here, you know, basically, God, just give me, give me just enough food. So I can be satisfied. I don't, I don't want too much. I don't want to be so full that, that I would get prideful and just say, well, who is God? But he's also saying, well, I, but I don't want to be kept so meager where I'm going to be tempted to steal and, um, and take the name of my God in vain. Right? He's saying, I don't want to, I don't want to become a thief. Right? I don't, I don't want to, to have to try to satisfy my hunger to the point to where I'm, I'm going to steal for it. But just keep me just, just just at that level where I don't have too much, I don't have too little. And, um, and there's some wisdom in that. <clears throat> now, taking heed lest you fall. Think about there's a lot of people in the Bible that we have as examples that we can use. I'm going to focus on one of them. But there's a lot of people that have made some pretty big mistakes in their life. We think about Moses, Okay. Moses killed a man with his bare hands when he was, he wanted to show that like, that he was there to deliver the people from the Egyptians, but he started off doing it the wrong way. He ended up murdering a man, he ended up killing a man that was Egyptian that was, I mean, he was, he, he was doing wrong, you know, he was, he was, you know, whipping or beating up the, one of the, the children of Israel, but it wasn't his job to go out and kill that guy. That wasn't, that wasn't what God called him to do. So he did it the wrong way, and that caused him then to flee and, and to not be able to take over that role for like 40 years. He had to come back, and, and then he was able to lead the children of Israel out. Peter is another example. I mean, Peter is one of the top disciples of, of Jesus Christ. All kinds of amazing miracles that we did. I, I, I preached a sermon on the, on the Apostle Peter, but you know, he did all those great things. But remember, he denied Jesus Christ three times. As Jesus prophesied, he denied him. That was a very low point in his life. You know, Peter, Peter fell. He didn't take heed. And Jesus even tried to admonish Peter. Jesus told him, he said, hey, you know, before, you know, this night, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. He's warning him. He's giving him. He said, look, you know, don't, don't deny me. He's like, he said, I'll never deny thee. I'm not going to happen. But he didn't, he didn't take heed because he did. Obviously, I mean, he, if he would have taken heed, then maybe that wouldn't have happened. But he, he didn't take heed, so he fell. But the one I'm going to focus on here is, is King David, of course. I mean, this is a real popular story. And if you would, please turn to 2 Samuel chapter 11. This is going to lead me into my next point. 2 Samuel chapter 11. We're going to see what King David did. Now, King David, great man of God. The Bible calls David a man after God's own heart. He was responsible for penning down the book of the Psalms. He was a righteous king. He's always referred back to in the Kings as you know, when, when kings did right, you, you read through the book of, of first, second Samuel, first, second Kings, it'll talk about the kings, it'll say, you know, um, King Josiah, you know, he did that which was right in the Lord, or some other king, he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. But then a lot of times you'll see him referred back to, he, he did that was right in the Lord, but not as his father David had done. And David is like the, the used as kind of like a standard or like a bar of like, of how righteous he was. And, you know, when people are referred back, they're often compared to David. Like, well, he was good, but not quite as good as David. His heart, you know, his heart wasn't quite as bright as with da as David's was. <laughs> but we're going to see, I mean, I'm saying that because, look, Moses, Peter, and David are all, I mean, greater men of God than probably anyone, any of us has ever known. Okay? Excellent, great men of God. I mean, they are going out in history. They're written, you know, Sign very significant portions of the Bible are dedicated, you know, like not dedicated to them, but they are, they exist in these portions of Scripture. And God gives them a lot of credit, and they are great men of God, which is all the more reason for us to remember that we need to take heed because all three of these men at one point in their life fell, and at one and at a point when they were doing great things already, and they were they were already doing good things for God. Second Samuel there in chapter eleven, look at verse number one. We're going to see what happened with King David here. And it came to pass after the year was expired. At the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. And it came to pass in an evening time 
that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. This is where we see David committing adultery with another man's wife, with Uriah, his soldiers, one of his, one of his best soldiers, committing adultery with his wife. Bathsheba. Why? Why did this happen? Well, the second point I want to make to help us to take heed lest we fall, we need to stay busy. Don't let yourself get idle. Look at verse number one. We'll see the context of what's happening here. <coughs> it says, And it came to pass after the, first, after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle. So this is the time the Bible says when kings go forth to battle. It says that David sent Joab. Now, was Joab a king? No. David was the king. When kings go forth to battle, David sent Joab to do the work. Joab was the captain of the host. But I'll tell you what, in those days, it's very different than it is these days, by the way. In those days, the kings led the people into battle. The kings actually were warriors, and they fought in the battles. They actually got, they were, they were hands-on. And you know what? If we did that today, this is totally not have anything to do with the sermon. But if, if, if we did that today, we would not be in so many wars. If the president himself, you know, the commander-in-chief was the one actually going out on the ground and fighting the battles. But what they do, them and Congress, they sit back at home. And they'll pass these laws for you to send your kids off to that war and to go off and die. And they're going to sit, they're going to dodge the draft, they're going to they're gonna do whatever it takes for them not to get their hands dirty, not to put themselves in danger, not to put themselves at risk. And you know, when this country was formed, it was formed with people who were generals, who were commanders like George Washington. Hey, they got involved in the fight. If there was going to be a war, they were going to be the ones leading the people. It's so not like that today. And, and these, these wimp presidents that we have now, they're just, it's ridiculous. I mean, they need to, if you're going to fight in a war, if you're going to decide, hey, we need to fight and we're going to put your kids' lives at risk, and you're going to send them off to go die against some other people who we usually don't even have any business over there in the first place, well, then you ought to be the first one setting your foot on the ground and the last one to leave. You're going to be making that decision for other people's lives. Anyways, that has nothing to do with the sermon. But, here, but this is, here's the thing. What David did, he should have been out there fighting the battle. Instead, what happens? He's idle. He's at home. Look at um, verse number two. It says, And it came to pass in an evening time, so it's nighttime, David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof. So now what's David doing? He's at home. He can't sleep. He's not doing anything, which I'll tell you what, if you're busy and you're keeping yourself busy and you're working hard, not sleeping is not your problem. <laughs> when, you, when you lay your head down on that bed, if you put in a hard day's work, you will not have a problem going to sleep. And David had this problem because he wasn't doing the work. He wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing. He laid down his bed. He couldn't fall asleep. Oh, I'm just going to go up for a walk on the roof. Right? So he ends up walking on the roof. And what happens? He, see, he, he spies on a woman that's, that's bathing. And then, lust conceives in his heart, brings forth sin. But here's the thing, if he would have been doing what he was supposed to be doing, if he just would have been out of the battle, this never would have happened. He never would have fallen into that great, horrendous sin of committing adultery with another man's wife that by God's law is worthy of the death penalty. Grievous sin David committed here, but he didn't take heed. One of the ways that we can take heed, keep yourself busy. These temptations that come at you. If you're busy, especially if you're busy doing the Lord's work, if you keep yourself busy, you're not going to have time to be tempted. <laughs> you're not going to have time to get into this garbage. And here's the thing. Idleness alone, when you don't have anything to do, you have nothing planned out, you have nothing to do, that's going to give your mind just, just all kinds of time to just conjure up whatever. And your heart, it's a lot more likely for your heart, to, the, the sinfulness of your heart, to, to just come up with something, something else to do that's, that's 
It has nothing to do with God, and that's going to lead you into sin. I mean, I can think back personally, the sins that I've gotten into in my life, oftentimes were a result of me just not having anything to do. I'm bored. What am I going to do? Well, let's just go out to the bar and have a drink. Or whatever. I mean, whatever. It doesn't matter. There's all kinds of things that you do when you, when you have nothing to do, nowhere to be, nothing to do, just... That's, when, that's where you're going to be tempted with sin. That's where you're most likely going to be able to fall. That's what happened with King David here. The Bible even says in Ezekiel 16, 49, you have to turn here, it says, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Now Sodom, God poured his judgment out and destroyed from off the face of this earth. Extremely wicked. You know, he never did that with anyone else before or since then to just rain fire and brimstone out and just wipe them out and annihilate them. But it says, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters, neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. So, my first tip was, be humble. Don't let yourself get proud. Don't let yourself get haughty. The iniquity of, the product of Sodom, pride. Fullness of bread. When you're doing wealthy, when things are going great for you, right? Take heed. Don't let yourself get proud, as Sodom did. And then it says, an abundance of idleness. They just had a ton of free time on their hands. Keep yourself busy. One of the reasons why they had abundance of idleness is because it says here also, neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. They weren't doing the good work that they were supposed to be doing. Hey, if you have a lot of money, if you've got things, you're going well for you, you've got time on your hands, why don't you do what the Bible says, pure religion and undefiled is this, that we visit the, 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 the fatherless and the widows and, um, oh man, I'm screwing up that verse in James, that that is pure religion. We need to go out and be doing the good works of God. If you got extra time on your hand, hey, go out, knock on doors, and go soul winning. Preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Visit the fatherless. Visit the widows. Visit the people in prison. You know, do things for people. Help people out, but keep yourself busy. Don't have a bunch of idle time where you're not doing anything. That's going to help. That's going to keep you falling into sin. Those are the three things, the four things mentioned here. I mean, Sodom, you don't even want to be going anywhere near the direction that Sodom went. But this is, this is why it happened. They had pride, fullness of bread, abundance of idleness, and they didn't strengthen the hands of the poor and needy. That was their downfall. And it, and it resulted, you know, you know how it resulted. We need to make sure we stay humble. We need to make sure that we stay busy doing the work. And here's the thing. If you have a humble attitude, humility is where you're putting someone else before you, where you think that the importance or the value, the, the, that what someone else's success is more important to you than your own, that's having a humble attitude. That's saying, hey, I'm more concerned about what they're, how they're seeing this person succeed than myself. That's having a righteous, a Jesus Christ-like attitude. He went through all kinds of things for us. It wasn't for himself, but he, is, he loved others. He loved us enough to go out. He, for, he, he didn't get very much sleep. He didn't eat very much food oftentimes. He was going out and, and doing things and healing people for the benefit of them, not for the benefit of himself. And he was giving us an example that we could do. If we have that humble attitude, hey, you're going to want to do the works to help other people out, which will help keep you busy. If you have that right mentality, excuse me, going out soul winning, visiting the fathers and widows, helping those in need. My third point, so we need to stay humble. We need to, <clears throat> excuse me. We need to stay humble. We need to stay busy. We need to stay in church. Turn if you would to Hebrews chapter 10. I'm almost done. We'll be finishing up here. Hebrews chapter 10. These are three things to help you to take heed so that you don't fall. The same way that so many other people have where we've had examples of in the Bible. Hebrews chapter number 10. Look at verse number 22. It says, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, 
but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fire indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. Now this passage, notice it says in verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. The assembling of ourselves together, that's church. The word church means congregation. It's the assembly. It's the assembling of ourselves together. The assembling of like-minded believers together. Don't forsake that. Don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And look at what it says. This phrase is not added in there for no reason at all. It has a lot of meaning. It says, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. What day is that? That's talking about the day of the Lord. It's talking about the day of Christ. That's talking about the day, you know, that before that we're going to be going through a lot of hard times. There is going to be great tribulation coming on this world. And you need to be in church. And don't forsake the assembling yourself so much the more as that day approaches. You need to be strengthened. You need to be edified. That's why it says in verse 24, it says, And let us consider one another. Consider, you'll know, think about other people. Consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Hey, when you come to church, it's not just to hear the preaching. There's other people in this church. A church is a congregation. It's a whole group of people. It's not just a pastor. It's everybody here, and we ought to be provoking one another to love and to good works. We're here to look out for each other. We're here to help each other out. We know that when tribulation is going to be coming, there's going to be hard times coming. Hey, we're going to look out for each other because the tribulation is going to be coming against the Bible-believing Christians. We need to be able to look out for one another and be able to rely on each other and defend with each other and protect each other, and that's what we're here to do. And you love each other and provoke each other, and hey, Provoke us to good works. When one, if it's just one person, and that's why like, you, you hear about the exercise plans and things like that. If you decide just to go out and do a workout on your own, it's a lot harder for you just to do that and actually get up and be motivated and stick to a schedule and go out and do these things. But when you have other people with you, hey, you feed off of each other. When you got, you know, the, the time where you're feeling lazy, you don't feel like doing anything, then someone, you know, your buddy calls you up and be like, hey, let's go to the gym, let's go work out. It should be exactly the same thing with church. We're, we're here to help edify you and, and to provoke you into good works and be like, hey, I'm going out so many. You want to come with me? And maybe, and, and it's happened to me before too, where, you know, I just kind of feel lazy. I'm just, I'm in the flesh. I don't really feel like doing anything for God. But then someone's just like, hey, let's go out. Let's do this. Let's, let's, you know, I had a, a, one of my real good friends, Brother Donnie, in the other church I went to, he would, um, he had a, this challenge. He's like, I, you know, I'm going to go out soul winning. Let's go out soul winning every single day for the next week. Let's just, just, just you and me, let's just see if we can do it. Let's go out every single day. Whether you're busy, just find the time and see if you can do it. And let's try to get at least one person saved every single day. Hey, that was great. That was motivating. That was something that I wouldn't have done on my own necessarily. But when he's there, you know, and, and we're talking about it, we're at church. And, he, you know, it's just like, okay, yeah, I'm on board. Let's do it. We're provoking one another on the good works, on the doing good things. That is something that you get from church. And it's not just coming from the preaching. It's coming from people around you. It's coming from others within the church. That's one of the reasons why church is so important. See, when you surround yourself and become friends with and, and, and know the people in the church, it's, I mean, it's an entire culture. We, we should not be, you know, with other people who do not want to be brought into sin, you know, or other people were, were, were not... Um, going the way of the world, so to speak, right? We're a peculiar people. We could provoke one another and you could and you could rub off on each other. You know, the Bible says iron sharpeneth iron. We need to to help others within the church. And we come here to get to know other people within the church and just help each other grow. Grow in Christ and grow in the Lord and provoke unto good works. Church is extremely important. We need to be we could be strengthened here, build friendships, have people look out for each other. And it, don't just view church as something that's a chore. Like, oh, I got I to gotta go to church. You know, God, God says I need to go to church. I, you know, I'm not supposed to say this. You know, and, and just like check it off the list. Okay, I went to church for the week. I'm done. I, I really hope that, and I don't think it is, but I really hope that that's not the mentality that anyone has here because that's, that would be a really poor attitude to have. I love the attitude that David had. He said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. We ought, to, we ought to look forward to coming to church. 
to hearing the word preached, to, to just visiting with, with, with other people, with other, other like-minded believers within the church. Get excited about it. Get excited about coming here. Get excited about doing the work for God. Because this is the people where you have people that honestly and truly love you and care about you. It's not just lip service here. And, and, and it's for everybody that I know that come here, I know it's not just lip service. Okay, one day maybe there will be people that come in that are fake or pretentious or whatever. Uh, you know, they'll probably end up leaving anyways because this church is going to be filled with people who honestly love you. And this is going to be a place where you're going to be able to hear the truth because the pastor loves you and he wants you to, to, to succeed in life and wants you to know the truth of the Bible and not hold anything back from you. I'm not going to hold back what the Bible says just because it may be negative. You might not like it. Now, I'm going to close with the parable of the sower. Very, very familiar passage in Mark 4. If you want to follow along, you turn to Mark chapter 4. The parable of the sower. And I'm just going to go over the portion where Jesus is explaining the parable. Jesus gives his, his explanation of the parable of the sower. Mark 4, look at verse number 14. Four, Mark 4.14 4, <clears throat> Jesus explains the parable. He says, The sower soweth the word, and these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word immediately receive it with gladness, and they have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things, entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some hundred. Now this parable is talking about a person who's sowing the word, is preaching the gospel of Christ. The first person doesn't get saved. He hears it, but you know it doesn't, he doesn't believe, he doesn't receive it. The devil comes away and takes the word out of his heart. He just forgets about it. But the, the, the rest of the three people, they get saved. Every single one, it says that they received it, or they believed. They, um, and it's not necessarily in this, one, in this one passage, but there's other renditions in the, the other Gospels. Every other one. So the first one who receives it, the, one that, the first one that gets saved or receives it, it says, um, and at the end of verse 16, it says, immediately receive it with gladness. They receive the word. They believe. But they have no root in themselves, so they don't... They don't get founded, they don't get grounded in church, they don't get rooted down in the Bible. They believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. They put their faith in Him. But they didn't get rooted. So they endure for a time, just like any plant that, you know, any weed or whatever pops up, if it doesn't have a root, it's not going to last very long. It's going to get knocked over, and that's exactly what happens. It says immediately, um, it says when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they're offended. So they're going to they're gonna fall out of church. They're not getting rooted down. Then they're just going to be you know, um, they're going to be offended because affliction and persecution are going to arise if you're a Christian and, and you know, you're going, to, you're going to decide to obey and listen to what the Bible says. But if you're not rooted down, when that persecution comes, it's going to offend you. And you'll get out of church and you'll stop serving God. And then he goes on to the next one where, the, I mean, that person gets out right away. It's just like, boom, like they just get, get offended and they're gone. But look at verse 19, or verse 18, and these are they which are sown among the thorns, such as hear the word, and, um, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in, choke the word, and becometh unfruitful. So here's someone who is probably even fruitful because it says it becometh unfruitful. So becoming unfruitful means they were fruitful. They were a fruitful Christian. They were doing things that were good, but the cares of this world... You start focusing in on money, start focusing in on other things that don't matter, the deceitfulness of riches and lusts of other things. You start getting minded on things that are not of God, just things that don't matter, the lust of this world, the riches. Hey, you focus on that stuff too much, it's going to cause you to become unfruitful. Because that's where your life is going to be. The Bible says you cannot serve God and mammon. You can't serve two masters. 
If you're all about money, if you're all about going out and making money, hey, you're not going to be serving God that way. You're going to become unfruitful. I mean, it's just the way it is. That's just what the Bible's saying here. We need to take heed. You might be a fruitful Christian today. You might be bringing forth fruit. You might be doing a lot of good things for God. Take heed lest you fall and become unfruitful. And the ways that we can do that, anyone that's here this morning is capable of falling. Any of us are. Myself included. We all need to take heed to ourselves. One, making sure we stay humble. Don't let yourself get proud. Don't get this proud attitude. Rely on God for everything. Two, stay busy. Don't let yourself get idle. And if you got, if you got spare time, if nothing else, read your Bible. Study the Word. Do I mean, pray. There's so many things that you can do that are going to be good for God that's going to keep you right and keep your heart right with God. Stay busy, but don't let yourself just get idle. Make a plan for yourself a day in advance. What are you going to do? What are you going to do tomorrow? Don't let that idle time creep in that can cause you to get into sin. And number three, stay in church. Stay in church so much the more as you see the day approaching. If you normally come, just, just once, try to get in church as much as possible. When we got the doors open, try to be here. That's the attitude we need to have with church because church is going to strengthen you. You're going to meet more people. You're going to get people that are going to edify you and that you'll be able to, to, to help out and they'll be able to help you and you'll be able to hear God's word preached more, and we need it more as the persecution and the tribulations are going to be intensifying and getting worse and worse as the day approaches. But let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for church. God, I thank you for your word. I pray that you would please help us all to stay humble, to keep a humble attitude, not to get lifted up with pride. God, I pray that you would please just help us to stay busy and to continue doing the things that are right so that we wouldn't get idle. And Lord, I pray that you please just help us to stay in church, that we can take heed unto ourselves, dear Lord. Help us not to stumble, help us not to fall. Help us to be able to keep these, these truths in our heart and to be mindful of them even after we leave today, dear God. Help us not to be forgetful hearers but doers of the work. Lord, I pray that you please just, just keep us here today and, and um, help us to be, to be changed as we leave today and... and um, that we wouldn't stumble and fall. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.